Wonderful. Um, so my interest in the relationship between uh, humankind and the landscape was peaked about seven or eight years ago when I began uh, doing some artist residencies in uh, wilderness spaces. And um, this is the gates of the Arctic. It's the Ula Valley. And this was the night we arrived and appropriately this space is called Thunder Valley. Um, I also spent some time in the community uh, wildlife um, ref refuge and a lot of time in plains looking at the landscape and uh, was just enamored with it. Um, it looked very much like um, an elaborate textile to me and so I was interested in that. And what you're seeing here are a combination of uh, wetlands, uh, peatlands and uh, permafrost during the summertime. Um, so during this time, uh, I became aware of the road to Ambler, um, which was a controversial proposed 220 mile road through the, um, these refuges and, and wildlands and wetlands. And um, this was to uh, support a copper mine. And two things struck me about it. Um, one was uh, the, the struggle of the communities in the area to kind of reconcile economic success uh, with preserving a way of life and um, maintaining healthy outcomes for people and the land. And um, the second thing was that in my artist's brain, I had this image of the landscape being filled and rolled up uh, like turf. Um, so I began to think about that. And I began to think about the Earth's surface and its function, its protective role. And during this time, um, it was a high fire season as well. So a lot of the area was charred. And I came up with the idea of creating these mantles. And what you see here is a detail from a mantle called the fireweed birthing mantle. And it um, references really the, um, the relationship between fire and regeneration of the landscape. And you can see um, the fireweed there floating up and then just sort of in the background, black spruce trees. And so this is the piece. And I created a series of these mantles uh, using the organic matter from these landscapes. This is the grasslands mantle. So um, I belong to many communities and I belong to a community in Mexico. And during this same time, um, this community, another small community uh, was also struggling with um, how to balance economic success uh, with healthy outcomes. And I became very involved in uh, the resistance and response to this. Um, you know, the, they're basically multinational corporations were coming into this environment and there were two, there was a mining interest and then a, a large resort. And the issues at hand for the people living there were um, primarily water rights and patrimonial rights um, to have access to their uh, historic resources and also the destruction of the land, um, it, it's critical habitat for migrating uh, marine animals. And also um, a species of mangrove that's uh, critical in, in uh, holding the dunes in place and um, preventing the loss of sands from the coastal area. And this particular area was important because there are very few um, put-ins and takeouts for fishing vessels um, in this particular area has, has this ability. So um, the loss of the mangrove was important as well. So 
So I um, became involved in creating interventions with local people. Um, this is Maria and we set up this concession stand and we gave away water uh, for free because it's a human right. And then Maria was able to um, explain what was happening uh, politically uh, to people, you know, um, a discussion began and there were a number of educational activities that were also associated with it. But to be honest, I really thought we just didn't have a chance uh, fighting these, you know, big corporations. Um, they were very powerful. And so what I did was I began to document the landscape and people living there. Um, in a sense, bearing witness and um, creating a, a record, a document, um, a, a, an archive of evidence, so to speak. And this was um, the beginning of a series called the Disappearing Landscape Series. And here you see construction encroaching on the environment. So another community I belong to is in Alaska, and we were experiencing the same kind of thing, um, blocking off of access to historical trails that were important to the community for a number of reasons, um, hunting, um, berry collections, uh, recreation, and just also um, transportation. Uh, these were uh, lines of communication. So I began um, during this time to create these series called the SHIELD series. And looking at the SHIELDs, not only because of their role um, as protection and defense, uh, but also using a reflective surface to uh, show the integration of the corporeal body as well as the landscape. You know, and it was kind of at this time that I began to recognize um, how deep the human relationship is with land, uh, that the places we live hold our memories. Um, it's not only linked to uh, our survival as a resource, um, but there's a real, uh, also strong emotional connection there. And I began to document the disappearance of uh, landscapes that I was familiar with in Alaska as well. This is Donnelly Lake. And um, it's basically the same ecosystem uh, that was transformed here uh, during the Delta Bali project. So sort of concurrent with this, a theme in my work has been um, hydrocarbons in the form of petroleum and, and uh, petroleum culture and looking at plastics. And this piece is called Tundra Sheaves and it looks at the, um, the passage of uh, carbon through the food chain. Now, this led to a series um, called the carbon bomb, in which I look at ways that we slow bomb the planet with carbon waste. And I find that a lot of times this waste is located in these fringe areas uh, where you have human activity overlapping uh, wilderness spaces. So the, the opposite end of the landscape uh, the natural landscape is, is really the developed or built landscape. And so I was also looking at what, what happens when um, we become disconnected from the landscape uh, in a series called Gray Slavery. And during, um, in this series, what I'm doing is looking at the uh, flow of energy through systems that exploit the working poor. Um, also looking at the architecture and artifacts in these spaces. Um,
This is a series of directed performance and installation that I photo document. Um, and it, it's sort of a measure of, of the way uh, both labor and the consumer are exploited by these systems. Um, where people are treated somewhat as uh, disposable and commodities. Um, it's an environment that's both sterile and overstimulating and in some sense dehumanizing. Um, so, you know, this is the opposite. Um, this is the uh, extreme end of the, the human experience um, when we separate uh, from the environment. So that um, brings me to where I am at the moment, uh, looking at Petescapes and the human relationship to that in this community in Homer. And I'm going to invite Rika Mao, who is part of the Drawdown group, to talk a little bit about the peat lands in this community. Wonderful, Cheryl. If you would go ahead and uh, stop screen sharing, we'll transition to Rika's screen. Thank you. That was a beautiful presentation. You're an amazing photographer. I take as much pleasure in seeing your photographs as I do, um, you know, hearing you speak. Rika, would you like to share your screen at this time? Sure, sure. First, I would like to thank Cheryl. That was really, really powerful. And what an honor it is to work with you. Okay. Okay. Is this sharing now? Yeah, just go ahead and hit that presentation mode. Go, uh, it's You were just hovering over it in the lower left. There it is. Go ahead and go into that okay. mode. Okay. Yep. Thank okay. You. Just to give you a little bit of background on the Homer Drowndown project, it was inspired from this book. We started meeting, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, about October of 219, pre-pandemic. And we read this book chapter by chapter, and it's uh, just how a, 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 how a smaller group can affect cl um, climate mitigation. And so we read each chapter, and at the end of 10, oh, I forget the timing, but after each chapter, we all decided which piece that we'd like to tackle, which chapter we'd like to tackle. And it was pretty clear that we chose peatlands. And from that nascent concept, we have gone quite a long way. Um, it's, it started with a fairly large group of at least 75 people. And it's been a lot of work of trying to figure out how can we focus in, what can we do? Because peatlands is such a huge, huge project. There's advocacy and outreach and education and you know partnerships and all that. So um, it took a while to come to that. And I just want to share, oops, that's not happening. So maybe Asia can yeah, Bring up. if you stop your screen share, go ahead All and close right. out of your screen share. All right. And let me just, while she's doing that, um, over this time period, we have really collaborated with a lot of different partners, agencies like um, the Kachemak Conservation Society, the Kachemak National Estuarine Research Reserve, uh, Cook and Le Keeper, uh, the city, the Homer Soil and Water Conservation District, the college, even uh, the Pratt Museum and uh, Extension doing work through uh, the the Nilchik native village tribe. So, um, so we've got a lot of partnerships, a lot of broad knowledge uh, coming into this. Um, and the mission statement is to help the world 
on a local level reach drawdown, the point in the future when levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start to steadily decline, thereby stopping catastrophic climate change as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. And Asia, I wonder if you can go to the, like our project, And what we're doing is community peatland surveys. We're reaching out. Oh, there are presentations every monthly meeting that are put on. Um, Kim McNett is on part of this. She's one of the participants and has led them. She and Bjorn have just been amazing um, partners in this. And I wonder if you just scroll down, Asia, um, down so arts, education, and outreach, we um, are working towards supporting KHL. That's another partnership is the Ketchmat Heritage Land Trust and collaborating with them. And one of our big projects is to raise money to help stewardship into perpetuity for selected peatlands and that partnership. So um, we're fundraising sort of, but we're um, also doing peatland surveys and they're going on right now. Cheryl has been a big part of that. There's also a restoration aspect to it because peatlands need to stay hydrated in order to continue to sequester carbon. Um, and if you just scroll down one more little, oh, Okay, and then we have a peat map. We have a schedule. Asia, if you even go down to the schedule, um, you'll see that Asia's, there's Cheryl's talk um, and all our meetings are open to the public um, and there are schedules all over. We have events and it, it's just a big, big community project. It's a community science project, but we are linking with scientists, artists, educators, presenters. Um, Ed Berg is involved. Um, so it's really a pleasure. So in reaching out with Benel, Benel has, has really helped us in getting the art aspect um, out there. And so we've reached out to the city and Benel in doing a big mural or mosaic or some art project, we've selected the airport terminal building um, where we'll install a mural on either side of the entryway. And um, we chose this idea because the airport is built on peatlands and <laughs> it, can, it is the highest fossil fuel emitter being airport transportation and uh, air transportation. So we thought it would be a really good location to educate and help people be aware of peatlands. What we really want to do is put peatlands on the map. Um, they're kind of an under acknowledged landscape, but they're really, really important. 3% of the world is covered in peatlands and yet second to the ocean, they sequester um, second to the ocean, the largest amount of carbon. So they play a huge role in, in climate change, climate mitigation, and they're gorgeous. And I think that Cheryl will be showing just the complexity that is there. There is so much to see in these peatlands and we've been walking together along the airport fence um, and all over. It's just an honor to be working with Cheryl on this and just walking these wetlands um, and peatlands. Rika, I just, while you've been talking so, you know, eloquently about Drawdown, I've um, been sharing Vanell's website, which shows the opportunity for artists to explore our call for proposals for Art for Peat and um, that they can apply right there through Bunnell Street Art Center to um, provide a proposal for a couple of mural opportunities that we are um, 
creating in collaboration with the city of Homer with the airport renovation, planned renovation project next year. So we have a, a call for proposals open until September 1st and um, folks are welcome to contact us at Benel to you know, learn more about this pretty user-friendly application where we're just seeking ideas from um, you know, the very broad community of Benel, painters, mosaic artists, collage of photographers, this open media. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is a really exciting um, collaboration. We're, we're excited to, to host this opportunity through Benel and help to raise awareness and funds. Shall I close out of this and we'll go back to Cheryl's presentation? Thank you. Okay, wonderful. You've got some more slides so, to share with us. Shall I, I have, I'll just open my screen share here. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, let, let me just double check. Um, there we go. So, um, this is a two-part residency, and this first half has really been about, for me, learning and research and just exploring the environment. And I've been looking at it at, at, from, from as many angles as I can. And uh, this is from the micro level. This is a little sundew plant, which I'm just enchanted with these. Uh, I've never seen these in the north where I live in the interior. Um, and they're just absolutely gorgeous, I think. Uh, gorgeous little carnivores. And uh, the reason they're carnivorous is that um, this is necessary in, in order for them to uh, get nitrogen. And um, because peatlands are somewhat um, nutrient deficient, uh, there are some nutrient deficiencies and nitrogen being one of them because they're basically 50% carbon. Um, so I've been learning about the ecology of the space as well, and the importance not just of the plant and vegetation life, but the wildlife that lives here. And here we have a, a moose skull that's just uh, disintegrating into the landscape. And this is an important source of calcium for uh, small critters. Um, when I was in Gates of the Arctic, they were emphatic about people not taking antlers or bones or anything because it is a critical source. Um, and then also um, it becomes a source of um, calcium mineral mineralization um, in the peatland itself. So then stepping back a little bit and looking at the macro picture and um, just sort of uh, invest, investigating what some of the challenges are to this landscape. Um, and it seems like one of the major challenges is drying out as Rika mentioned. And um, sources for this are uh, climate change for sure, um, but also development and draining of the land. Uh, and here we have an example of um, development encroaching on the land. And uh, it makes me think that in a healthy natural environment, um, you, can, you can measure the health of the environment by um, noting whether there is an apex predator uh, present or not. Um, and that would be like, you know, wolves or lions, um, just depending on the landscape. But what's happening is um, increasingly in built landscapes, um, man is becoming the apex predator. And I just uh, love the serendipity of coming across this image and finding this. Um, again, looking at some of the challenges, and this is the chain link fence surrounding the airport that Rika mentioned. I love this little spruce, you know, it's kind of, it's holding fast and shaking at the same time. Um, there's a proposal for a uh, um, a road to be built on the uh, airport internal side of this fence in order to help maintain the fence line. But as people have pointed out, you know, you'll be obliterating a certain amount of wetland um, and you managed to build the fence with, with, um, without a road. So perhaps you could maintain it without a road as well. Um, looking at adaptation and resilience, 
Yeah, here we have the juxtaposition of a chocolate lily in a dream. Um, it's adapted to the drainage um, from its normal wetland habitat um, and right next to a transportation system. Now, another challenge is invasive species into the landscape. So as I was wandering around Homer, um, I came across a garden center and here were these um, piles of turf. And turf is um, the term that's used often in Ireland to uh, describe peatland. So I, I, I started to look at the, the language um, of, of peatlands and um, just sort of find out what the origins on it were. Um, and it was pretty interesting, it, you know, basically is a, a Celtic word. And I thought that it probably described the material of the peatland. Um, but in fact, what it does is it describes the piecing and parceling out. So the, the um, human action um, that's connected to uh, this landscape. So part of the research also involved, um, you know, looking at city planning maps, um, finding out where these areas were located, uh, what the usage was for them, what the ownership was. And here we have uh, a map of the streams in the area. And I just included this because it, it felt very corporeal to me. Um, it felt like a body. Uh, this could be a muscle, uh, the little image in the bottom could be a pancreas. Um, and so sort of a representation of a, a living organism. And what we have here is um, an overlay of um, land use designated by the city uh, over the top of the wetlands. And we see this division, this dividing up into squares once again. Um, and it seems to me that this historic practice of slicing and cutting peatlands uh, appears deeply embedded um, in the DNA of the word, um, but also becomes almost an expectation when we look at city planning maps, you know, the, the peatlands fate seems to be predetermined by these series of rectangles um, that, you know, are mirrored on the, on the paper. So I had a fun day going out with the um, drawdown group. They were doing a training session for um, people who would lead citizen science research on peatlands. And here you'll notice we've got a grid again. So even you know with the best of intentions, when we're studying this environment, we're sort of dividing it up, cutting it and slicing it um, in a sense in order to look at it. And um, the, the purpose of these surveys, really, um, I think that it's pretty well known where these lands are, but um, the big question is how much carbon do they actually sequester? And um, the value of that in mitigating uh, climate control, but then also the risk of um, uh, the lands drying out and that being released into the environment. Um, Kim McNett took me on a tour and we went to um, a coastal area where you can see that the peatlands are um, eroding uh, into the, the ocean here. And it was curious to me looking at this, um, you know, just can you see the arrow here pointing at the peatlands, um, the chunks of the peat as they drop off. But yeah. I didn't notice it at the time. But when I looked in later, um, I could see that there were these stumps that had been cut off. And I was curious about whether that had happened after the slumping or before the slumping. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of curious about that. So here we have a, a close up of the, the peat um, on the slope. And this is, it's dried out and um, it very much has the texture of cardboard to me. Um, 
visually, I don't find it particularly interesting. Uh, I find this, the surface a lot more interesting, um, but I'm just um, really just kind of exploring it as a material. It is, of course, a, a fossil fuel, you know, when it's completely compressed, it becomes coal. Um, and actually, I should uh, just kind of go back a little bit. Um, so what the material is, basically, it's vegetation and mostly in the uh, form of, um, I'm going to butcher this, but spag sphagnum, uh, moss. And here we see quite a bit of that moss in this landscape here, um, along with the treasure of a lot of um, other um, vegetation, the spruce, um, Labrador tea, uh, you can see also um, berry shrubs there. Uh, despite the fact that it's not a very nutrient rich um, subsurface, there's a lot going on on the surface and um, a lot of nutrient value for the uh, critters on this landscape, but also for humans. And so it leaves me looking at, you know, food sources of the past and um, where our primary food sources come from at the moment. And um, it's notable that we, to me, um, almost humorous that we have these organic um, collected food sources and we have them sequestered in plastic, um, a hydrocarbon. So I'm going to just kind of um, leave us all with that thought. Uh, these, uh, these themes of cutting and slicing, uh, capture and sequester uh, are all fodder for, I hope, some uh, future artwork. And so um, I'm gonna exit out of the peatlands now and we'll just see what uh, comes out of the mire of my mind. Um, in the future, and um, I'm looking forward to coming back in the fall and working with the community and um, hopefully bringing some art with me and creating some art. So I'll just get out of my screen share. Am I out of the screen share? Yeah. Okay. Thank great. you, Cheryl. That was fantastic. Again, so so wonderful hearing, you know, um, your eloquence and also those beautiful images and projects that support this long-term investigation of yours. Uh, we'd love to see your face if you want to. Uh, oh yes, back on. Yeah. and and welcome everybody into um, the conversation. Kim McNatt, we're so glad to have you with us today. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, before we transition, I'm sure into many other points and questions that others might have, what sort of reflections uh, do you have, Kim, about the, the presentation and, and the work of um, an opportunity in collaboration with Drawdown around Cheryl's visit? Sure, yeah, thank you for um, the invitation to speak. Thank you so much, um, Benel, for hosting and Cheryl for um, coming and, Rika and everyone else who's been involved in the Drawdown project, this truly has been just this in incredibly collaborative um, endeavor. And it's really fortunate for us, I think, that Cheryl um, has you know, been willing to join on and embrace sort of this uh, community endeavor that's so place-based here and how well her artistic medium and, and style like has, has fused with this. Um, I think in reflection on seeing the thoughts that you're developing, first, I just loved that you were wanting to come and just learn and listen first and derive your inspiration from like what that environment and the human elements were telling you and to see you create this, um, this analogy between that like slicing up on the small scale to how we divide and think about our land. Um, as, a, as a commodity on a large scale 
Um, and then even showing that grid and making me realize like, oh my gosh, even it's, it's like this ingrained human nature that we have, right, to compartmentalize. And that's like how we're isolating our thoughts with that and how um, just, you know, uh, uh, challenging people to think outside, literally outside the box, like literally. <laughs> Um, I think it's just beautiful and I look forward to continuing to collaborate. Um, I, I would also just like to share with folks, um, you know, we have Cheryl uh, visiting and doing these amazing projects. We have the call for proposals that Brunel has put out. We're also developing and are going to be releasing soon um, something that is an invitation for anybody and everybody no matter your background, no matter your interest, to go have a connection to a peatland, have an experience in a local peatland and reflect on that in whatever way resonates with you. So if you're a practicing artist or a writer or a poet or a naturalist or whatever it is that speaks to you, a conservationist, um, or if you would like to just answer the prompts that we will be um, providing, we're having something called a, it's, we're calling it a personal peatland survey and it's extremely accessible to anyone and you, it will be hosted on our website um, in the next couple of weeks. And it's an invitation for anybody and everybody to co uh, contribute to our map, both literally and figuratively of how we know and interact with our local peatlands. So thank you all so much. I think that's an incredible thinking, tool, Jim. Isn't it? And is it fair to say that peatlands really span Alaska's greater tundra and the whole system that stitches us together, you know, is, is uh, one that defines a much bigger space than this small action in Homer. And so I'm pleased that, you know, we have artists from, you know, far away joining us within Alaska today because there's so many spaces for consideration of the work of drawdown, right? In Alaska. So um, Cheryl, um, would you like to talk uh, more, you know, about um, your project here in Homer and, and how you feel, um, you know, you're positioned for your return in the fall how do you um, how do you envision uh, the the next stage of your investigation unfolding? Or maybe you need some time to gestate. You've got several months in between. That's got to be a good thing. And and I think that's exactly what I'm going to do is is gestate. Um, I'm going going to take some of the content that I've um, been able to collect um, in the way of photographs. I'm thinking about um, different ways that I could manifest that, either using um, projection perhaps as a tool um, or creating uh, installation kinds of spaces. Um, and even just um, uh, taking the material of the land, which I've done before with the mantle series and perhaps creating a mantle piece. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, coming back because um, not only to create work, but um, to join the drawdown group in um, perhaps an exhibit that shares the work of other artists as well uh, from the community. That's right. You and I joined Satchel Pondefino and um, Jennifer Gibbons, the director of the Pratt Museum on Wednesday for a tour of the space. And the Pratt Museum is graciously inviting um, this collaborative drawdown project to share in the museum space um, projection that, that you're considering an exhibition opportunity and public engagement on the lower level, right? So we're, we're exploring the idea of um, an exhibition gallery in the lower level, which features um, a major installation of your own, and then the opportunity for several other local artists to reflect and share on the work that they're making around Pete, because it is, you know, it really is a pervasive theme in subtle and big ways, you know, whether you're considering that beautiful painting that Oceana Wells made for the Drawdown website, I'd love to just see that small or large. And then I'm really curious, um, word has it that uh, other artists have been working with Pete 
um, making um, documentation of um, our, you know the the um, local effort to um, within drawdown that even what pre predates the organization of drawdown here like Bjorn Olsen has been making beautiful footage of artists of, of work of the landscape and and um, the different kinds of scientific investigations that have been surrounding that. So I'm excited about an opportunity to kind of like bring these things together, right? And we talked about, um, well, Satchel talked about even just physically making a peat landscape that's actually a cake and, you know, get families and, and, and kids there to just look at both the beauty and the vulnerability and, um, you know, talk more about how it impacts all of us. Yeah, to really celebrate the landscape. That's right. This this fragile, intricate, highly vulnerable landscape that that literally connects all of us. Think about how thin the peat mantle is across the bay in Halibut Cove, for example. You know, with that substantial rocky base, but then the thin mantle of soil on top, and then you you know you go into places like the interior of Alaska where the peat is deeper. Tell us a little bit about the work of the recent peat survey, um, Kim, and what, what kind of depths you were, of course, there too, Cheryl, what kind of depths were you calculating for the peat when you were up on, um, up on the hill behind Homer and other places? I think this is your wheelhouse, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. So um, the Ketchumac Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve has been undergoing you know, the study of peatlands and peatlands related to climate change for many years. There are ongoing projects and we're very fortunate to have them as advisors, collaborators, protocol design. So this idea um, that you know, peatlands, the study of and understanding of peatlands um, is predominantly within the scientific community. Um, at least this is my interpretation of it. The, the pe if you want to know about peatlands, you find you find the scientists um, and and ask them what questions they're asking. And in general, I'd say about um, our history of understanding climate change as well. Um, it's it, it's it's been largely handled um, by a, a particular discipline, the scientific um, understanding. So um, one idea of what can we do as a community and, um, you know, even if we don't have a scientific background or even very much of a scientific interest, is there still a way that we can, we can help with that? And that's where I see this drawdown um, process as extremely effective potentially for, you know, the, the reversal of, of climate destruction is that it creates an inclusive environment for everybody's understanding and background to have a platform. So for us as organizers, you know, how can we work within um, the already established, you know, working understanding of peatlands? What type of data should we be collecting? Where will that, how will that data be managed and where will it go and how can it contribute to things like global carbon markets? Well, thankfully the reserve is here to help us understand Here's the equipment. This is what we want to know. We want to know how deep it is in all these places so we can learn the percent carbon that's in it in other ways. And then we can understand how much we have and how it's fluctuating in the environment. Okay. And that's great. Right. Um, but there are so many other ways that we can learn to interact with and appreciate and respond to and with our landscape. Um, and so a lot, you know, as, as Cheryl knows, you know, that art speaks to people's hearts and souls, and it, cr it creates a sense like a visceral sense of caring and appreciation. And so um, I think the fact that we've reached out and we have this incredibly diverse and um, interdisciplinary project is this hope that we will reach more people than the data and the numbers would reach, right? We can reach people on this other level. And by doing a community science project, we're inviting people out to the landscape. Almost this is this excuse, like, yes, this data will be useful. Yes, we wanna know how deep they are. But yes, also we wanna connect people to this landscape and have this sense of buy-in. Like you are an active contributor to the outcomes of our understanding and our relationship to these places. So the survey is an opportunity for community engagement and we're very much designing it in a way that is, you know, where both one of our priorities is, 
we reach all these different places and, and we reach areas that are particularly threatened um, as a way that we can draw attention and awareness to them. And then also how do we facilitate these surveys in a way that is going to reach a variety of different people and who are those people? Who do we want to connect to the landscape and what ways will make this most efficient and, and, and easier for them to have access to? Um, so a lot of it is building an understanding, but a lot of it also is a build is building awareness and and appreciation and affection for. Um, so and we hope to you know utilize the opportunity of our fundraiser in a similar way. How do we reach certain people with that? Um, how do we reach people with this personal peatland survey? Um, a big part of why I'm excited about that is that um, it is sort of a counterbalance to the scientific data which is very um, standardized. So you in order to have a reliable data set, you have to have everyone collecting it in the same way so that it all builds into um, you know, a database that you can analyze. Um, it doesn't work if everybody does it differently. However, just like thinking outside the grid, a lot of people have extremely valuable things to contribute to this that don't fit within those boxes. So have you been watching a peatland over decades since you've lived here and seen it change. That story matters a lot. Or how, you know, how did it impact you? How do you want to express the way that you have been changed um, by this landscape? And so that is sort of this dual opportunity and to bring that all together to share. Because um, what I would say about the drawdown philosophy and project and actions is that climate change is um, very uncertain. It's undetermined. We don't know exactly the best way to respond to this, but we do know that we don't have to do it alone. We have each other and we have our community. We are stronger and more resilient when we are diverse and we are here to support each other. And so together we're really entering this unknown. We can't be sure how effective we are. We can't be sure of the outcome, but we can be sure that we can be here for each other and that we can help make each other stronger. So thank you all so much for giving me that little platform. Thank you, Kim. You know, you speak so evocatively about how stewardship is a cultural endeavor and also the relationship to Pete is age old. We have Petra Lyshetsky joining us today who you know, grew up in Northern Germany. And Petra, I wondered if you could speak briefly, if you would, just about the relationship to Pete that you know, um, from your childhood, how did you perceive Pete and how did you relate to Pete and, and, and any impacts or in, in inspiration coming out of the conversation today? Would you like to share? Sure, you know, I, I hadn't actually thought about that, that part of my childhood until listening today. And uh, we used to take walks and uh, that, that part of Germany um, around Hanover and, and sort of between Hamburg and, and Hanover and Brunswick um, is flat. And uh, it, uh, it had, peat is Toff in German, T-O-R-F. And uh, it was a very rural area. And um, the, the locals would still cut it for fuel. Um, and I, I remember it, it, was, um, it was a very peaceful land, landscape. Um, and, and seeing Cheryl's photographs um, brought, that, brought that back. Um, and in fact, I have not been there in a long time. And I think the next time I would like to drive up there again, um, you know, visit, visiting. It's made me curious again. And I do know that, um, you know, climate change, my goodness, um, the lack of rain, you know, will destroy, um, will destroy those, those areas. So um, yeah, that's, that's my memory. So yeah. uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Petra. You know, you you just your comments reminded me that 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 long relationship to Pete and how that relationship to be better stewards needs to change. You know, yeah. we I grew yeah. up burning coal. We went down to the beach and burned coal, which of course yeah. is you know um, I don't know if you'd call it it's not petrified peat, but it's just highly compressed. You know, very mm -hmm. very old vegetative layers and 
and um, the impacts, of course, of burning coal and even wood are greater than heating, you know, environmentally are greater than heating your home with natural gas. And hopefully we'll have and develop much better alternatives for the future. Yeah. But we, we are kind of weaning ourselves from cultural habits, histories and stories and creating new ones as Kim pointed out so eloquently today. If there's other comments from our listening audience, they're really welcome. Anybody um, could paste a comment into the chat or speak up today. Cheryl, are there other images or thoughts too that, that you wish to share? I, I have one thought and and that is um, that something that I've learned is how complex uh, stewardship is. It's not just a matter of putting a preservation stamp on a piece of land that with that comes certain responsibilities. Um, and that, you know, uh, change is a part of the natural world as well. And so how much do you interfere with that in your stewardship? Um, how much access um, do you create uh, to that land and, and in that um, sharing of it with people also impact it, you know, just as something as simple as a trail, you know, do you want to disperse uh, the, the user group or do you want to contain them uh, and so that you're, you know, sacrificing one area for another? Um, yeah, it's complex. Um, do you do flood an area in order to, you know, combat the dryness or not? Anyway, just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, I'm sure we all have many. If anybody else wishes to share, um, uh, you know, you're certainly welcome. It's been a really, um, it's been a really informative hour, and it's also been filled with a lot of um, inspiration through your creative inquiry, Cheryl. And I'm looking forward to seeing others' responses in September at the Pratt Museum for the um, Art for Pete exhibit that we're developing. And if anyone has questions, ideas, interest and in participation, please do um, contact um, me here at vanellarts.org. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. I wanna thank everybody for joining this conversation today. It's so important to all of us that it's a diverse um, participation and to shift from the, the, the burden of um, scientists to artists and share the, the burden of stewardship together is a really important one. So thank you. Any last comments? I, I wanted to just make a comment just listening to your about your work, Cheryl, and your un, uh, rewilding project, and your last comment about all the complexities involved. Every one, each one of your projects reflects the complexities of an issue and all the impacts of each issue uh, between people and nature and um, yeah, I, and it's amazing how, what a broad, a broad reach that you're taking on. Um, at some point, do you envision some way of connecting all these projects, whether, whether it's a publication or. Annette, you disappeared. And this project is that. fabulous. I look forward to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I lost a little bit of the thread there. Anyway, I look forward to being part of the, um, looking at some wet look. You're taking each project. Uh, to answer your initial comment about um, pulling things together, I think in a sense, rewilding does that. Um, although I'm changing my ideas around rewilding as well. Um, it, it's become clear to me that the disconnection of the spirit and the physical self from the landscape is sort of um, an element of um, losing our humanity. And so the, the rewilding project that I've been doing is just investigative and thinking about that. and. Um, thinking of ways obviously to reconnect. And of course, in the context of the pandemic, um, in a way it's, it's done so much more than I could have ever imagined uh, turning those scales upside down and reconnecting people to the environment. It's, it's become um, a, a premium in, in terms of uh, people's life experience. And so it's, it's happening 
you know, irregardless of me.